When I was born, the Second Vatican Council was already in full swing, so I have no personal recollection of what people sometimes call the pre-Vatican Church, and I rely on the experiences of people who were older than I, who lived through that time, to tell me what it was like, what the prevailing attitudes were. And lots of people tell me that before the Second Vatican Council, the preaching and the attitude that of a lot of people in church was pretty much hellfire and brimstone. You know, you're all miserable sinners and you're all going to hell and everything like that. And that may not be everybody's experience. Some of you who live through it might say, Gina, I never experienced that. But there are certainly a number of people who claim that that's what it was like for them. Well, if that's true, one thing I can say from my own experience is that after the Second Vatican Council, a lot of people flipped the other way, did a complete 180 and started talking only about God's love and the good and happy things and overdosing in it to the point that we never talked about sin, that everything was only everybody's wonderful, everybody's good, you know, and don't worry about it. You're all great. And. The problem with that is we never allow the gospel to challenge us to be better. It presumes that everything is okay and we'll never be asked or called to make the world a better place. And an example, a perfect example of that happened when I was in the seminary. One of my classmates went out uh, to teach religion. He was assigned to teach religion in a parish. And the director of religion told him, here in this parish, we don't teach the children about sin. We don't talk about anything negative. We only dwell on the positive. We only talk about God's love for them. And I understand where that comes from. The desire to build people up, not to beat them over the head with their sins and make them feel terrible, but to build them up and help them understand God's love for them. And so I get that. But while it sounds uplifting and beautiful and encouraging and so positive, it's really a danger in the long run because it keeps us from challenging ourselves to be better. And it presumes that the world was perfectly fine and there's no reason for any of us to change. And of course, we all know very well that's not true. The world is not fine. Jesus didn't come into the world to save a perfect world. He came to save a broken world. And without looking at the challenges in our lives or challenging us to look at our sins and grow better, Christ is of no use to us. So we need a healthy balance between the two, either all fire and brimstone or all just love and compassion by themselves do not lead us to Christ. A mixture of the two. Sure, we don't want to beat people over the head every Sunday and tell them how horrible they are. Of course not. Yeah, and we do remember fundamentally God loves us unconditionally as we are. But he also loves us enough not to leave us where we are, but to challenge us to be better. In fact, that's what he came to do. Because of his love for us, he wants to restore what was broken in our world because of original sin. And you and I know very well we live in a broken world. Everything is not wonderful. We have a lot of pain and a lot of frustrations in life. And much of it comes from human sin, either our own sin or somebody else's sin that affects us. And the Lord came to change that. But sadly, there are some people, even today, even I find among church going people, people who don't want to be challenged, who don't want to be told they have any sins to overcome, people who just want to dwell on the loveliness of God and get very angry if somebody even challenges people to be different, to say, no, you can't do that. That is sinful. That doesn't lead to God. And a common response or the whole epitome of the argument for many people will be what I've heard from people a lot of times. Well, the way I see it, which is always a dangerous way to start anything, the way I see it, because we are not perfect and our vision is not the truth. But they say, the way I see it, God is all loving. If God is all loving, he wouldn't condemn anybody to hell. What loving God would condemn someone? So as long as I believe in Jesus, that's fine. And I don't have to worry if I sin. And God's going to say, okay, well, that's all right. As long as you believe in me, I forgive your sins. Come into heaven. But there's a fatal error in that argument. First of all, they forget that God doesn't condemn anyone. The condemned person condemns himself. God has come to save all of us. And yes, he wants everyone to be saved, but he gives us free will and our free will, which is what makes us different from the animals that we can choose right from wrong is precisely what has to be changed. 
Adam and Eve used that free will the wrong way. They ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God forbade them to do. And that's a wonderfully poetic way of God saying to them, don't try to decide for yourself what's right and wrong. I am God, you are not. I can't be wrong, you can. I can't be deceived, you can. If you follow what I tell you, even if it's difficult, it will be the truth. You can absolutely guarantee that because I can't be wrong. But if you go after what you think in your mind or feel in your heart should be right or wrong, you can be wrong. And you will commit sin and you will ruin the beautiful world, the paradise I've given you. And that's exactly what they did. They decided to follow their own mind and their own heart and not listen to God. And when that happened, did they discover, hey, now I'm just like God and now everything is perfect? No, they saw their shame and sin was in the world and everything we've experienced since that time. All of the evils and everything come as a result of that original sin. And so our world has been turned upside down. I like to think of it from the movie, The Poseidon Adventure, if you remember that, where the the wave turns the ship completely upside down. And those who are trying to be saved have to go against the grain, against their logical thoughts. Most people, in fact, many of the ones who survived, if you remember in the movie, decided just to get out the same way you would any other thing, by going to the upper decks and go out on the deck and then they could get out from there. But the minister and a few others knew, no, that won't work. The only way to get to be saved is actually go the reverse. Go to the very bottom of the ship, which is now on the top, and you know, make their way through the thin way there where they could break through and be saved. And of course, that journey through the trip, uh, through the ship was Everything had to go against the normal. They were walking on the ceiling. Everything was upside down. And they had to go against everything that seemed like a logical, reasonable way to do things. And it wasn't easy. And some of them didn't make it, but others did. And that's what Jesus is talking about in the gospel today, when he says, try to enter through the narrow gate. Now, somebody asked him, are many people going to be saved or only a few? He doesn't give a number. He doesn't say, yes, many will or no, only a few. But he says, try to strive to enter through the narrow gate. Many people will try, but will not be found strong enough. In other words, to be saved, we have to be working at it. Just like an athlete who wants to be in the Olympics has to work hard each and every day to be the best they can be, to be at the top of their ability so that they can win that medal. So you and I need to do in order to be able to enter heaven. If somebody is saved, they're saved by the grace of God. But if somebody is not saved, it's their own fault because they haven't listened to God. And why doesn't God just make it easy and say, well, I'll save you all? Well, because he can't do that. He can't force us into heaven. I think sometimes the image we have of heaven is kind of like St. Peter is standing at the pearly gates. And when we die, us all stands before him and he has a clipboard with all of our actions on it and counts all the pluses and all the minuses. And as long as we have more pluses than minuses, yeah, you lived a good life. Okay, in you go. But if there's one or two more minuses, he says, eh, 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 eh. everything is in balance and you get a couple of minuses. So into purgatory until you make up for them. Or if he looks at it and says, there's basically no pluses here at all. You've got all minuses. No, nope. down to hell you go because you haven't earned heaven. And we think of it that way, but that's not really what going to heaven will be. Theologically speaking, to go to heaven means to be perfected, to completely conform our will to unite with Christ's will, that we desire and think the way Christ thinks. And so God can't do that for us. He can't change our will. He can't force it. Then it's not our free will. He gives us every strength, all of the sacraments, all the graces every day to try to follow him. But you and I must make the decision. It's kind of like a ship. People are stranded on a, on a desert island and a ship comes by to take them to freedom. And the captain says, come on on the ship. And some people do. But there are others who say, no, I don't want to come on. Well, the captain doesn't go on shore and drag them onto the ship. They have to desire it. Same with us. The Lord has worked our salvation by his death on the cross. But we have to follow. We have to do what he tells us to do. We have to make the changes in our lives that will change things around, that will make us naturally inclined to do what is right rather than what is wrong. And sadly, as I said, sometimes some people don't want to hear that. They don't want to be challenged. And they just want to hear the, the sweet Jesus, you know, the, the easy Jesus who just tells us nice, soft things. 
I was watching this past week an episode of The, the Chosen. And in it, the, the episode I was watching, Jesus is preparing the Sermon on the Mount. And he's going over it with Matthew. And when Jesus asks him what he thinks, Matthew says, well, don't you think you're being a little harsh in some of those demands? Those things there seem to be really rough. Don't you think you should be easier and you know, give them things that are a little more encouraging? And Jesus says to him, well, what do you think? I've come to tell the people, hey, folks, everything you're doing is perfectly fine to just keep it up and just do everything the way you've been doing. He says, no, I've come to save a broken world to show people how to change. And that change sometimes will mean big changes for us, radical changes in everything in our being. And it will at sometimes be a struggle and it certainly will always be a challenge. And some people are not up to the challenge and they fall short, but they will not be strong enough to enter the narrow gate. But for us, it needs to be a time where we devote ourselves completely to the Lord and decide that, no, we're going to make the differences and the changes in our lives that will help me follow the Lord. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to do the wrong thing and sometimes how it takes all of our strength to do what's right? And that's the natural way of life for us. But that's because of original sin. That is our fallen nature. Original sin is washed away in baptism when we're given the sanctifying grace to help us strive for heaven. But now our job is to try to change our thought process, our beliefs, everything we do, so that we are naturally inclined to do what's right and it would be out of order for us or out of character to do the wrong thing. The great saints did that, and that's why they're wonderful examples for us. And that's what you and I are called by the Lord to strive to do each and day, each and every day, to follow him with all of our ability so that we change everything. We turn everything upside down, that is upside down, right side up again, so that we are naturally inclined to do what is good, and it would be really out of character for us to do what is wrong. And of course, again, that does mean we have to make a radical decision in our mind. We have to be countercultural. We have to go against the flow of today's world because today's world tells us, follow your heart, whatever you think is right and affirm anything anyone believes. And yet that's precisely what original sin was, the temptation to follow our hearts and our minds rather than the Lord. And so we have to tell people, no, we cannot just follow our own minds and hearts. That's what's messed up the world. That's what destroyed it. And that's precisely what Jesus came to save us from, from our own errors of our thoughts and our hearts and teach us again the truth that will lead us to him. And you and I today, especially in a world that is so contradictory to the gospel, will be countercultural. We have to go against the flow and make a conscious effort each and every day to be intentional disciples of Christ and to say, no, I will not follow what the world tells me is right and wrong. I will follow what the Lord says is right and wrong, because the world's way is what's ruining things. God's way is what will save things. And so to strive each and every day to change the whole way we think, the way we act, the way we believe, everything of value to us to completely reverse it and make everything Christ-centered, Christ-indulgent rather than self-centered and self-indulgent. And when we put Christ first and say, Lord, all I desire is that my heart and yours are one, my will and yours are one, no matter what it takes for me, no matter what great sacrifices I have to make, no matter what other people think of me and all the names they may call me because I'm following you, Lord, I want you. I want you, Jesus. I don't want the values of this world. I want your salvation. You are the only one who can make the world a better place. You have the truth and we have to follow it. And the reason the world is not perfect is not because God is not doing his part. It's because we are not doing our part. We are not following what Christ taught us to do. He worked our salvation. He showed us the way. But you and I have to walk it each and every day. And yes, yeah, sometimes it will be difficult, but something else I've often discovered through the way is that the challenge of the gospel sometimes can be very fulfilling, very enriching. When we see something in a different way that we haven't seen before, when some new light dawns in us of God's call to holiness and what it means for us, for our own hearts, for the people around us, and we say, wow, I never thought of that before. That's great. It actually becomes a journey of wonder a journey of hope, a journey of peace and happiness. So it's not to make it sound like each and every day we're going to be miserable. You know, sometimes we will have difficult moments. 
Jesus never said following him would be easy. In fact, he did say, uh, anyone who wishes to follow me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow in my footsteps each and every day. But in doing so, we will save our lives because whoever would save his life in this world will lose it. But whoever loses his life in this world for his sake and the sake of the gospel will save it for eternal life. You and I, my friends, have the answer. We have everything that is necessary to make the world the, pl the perfect place God meant it to be. We have the gospel of Christ. We need only to follow it in our own lives and teach others to do the same. If we can do that and we can teach others to do that, then indeed we will fully know the truth, the truth that comes from Christ, the truth indeed that will set us free, that will give us the peace the world desires. May Jesus Christ be praised now and forever.